It is an honor to be here this morning. I want to thank uh, Brent and Steve for their ministries with you uh, as your pastors. Uh, I want to thank the choir and the musicians. Isn't this amazing? Uh, amen. amen. Uh, I want to thank everyone who put this day together. I'm aware that it really requires a lot of leadership and sacrifice and I do know I'm the primary obstacle between everyone and a great meal. Amen? Uh, and in case you're wondering, there is a clock there right in my line of vision. Um, I want to thank you for being the church in this community uh, for 125 years uh, and, uh, and I want to simply thank you for starting your week uh, worshiping God. In our time, in our culture, no one goes to church for no reason. Uh, and it is, it is significant that you are in a sanctuary, in a service of Christian worship, beginning your week. And I'm grateful to you for that. And I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Candace Lewis, uh, your district superintendent, for her gifts and for her leadership among us as well. I wanted to reflect on this passage of scripture uh, by thinking about what it means for us to be Christians, followers of Jesus, in the United Methodist Church. Uh, my wife has a, a way of, of expressing it. She says, you can't just bake a cake. You have to bake some kind of cake, you know, a carrot cake or a chocolate cake or a pound cake. I'm not trying to make you hungry, uh, but you, there it has to be some kind of cake. And that's true also in the body of Christ. There are many different kinds of churches. We're not the best kind of church. We just happen to be a particular way of following Jesus. And that is the United Methodist Church. I love to think about history. Um, I come from several generations of people in my family tree who live in Florida. My great-grandfather, whom I knew very well, lived in Tampa in the 1910s and 20s. He lived in West Tampa. He worked with the Cuban community. His father, my great-great-grandfather, came to Tampa from Iowa because of his asthma. He needed to live in this part of the world. And he was Henry Plant's photographer. So he took a lot of pictures of the Spanish-American War out in the harbor uh, and of a lot of things that were going on in Central Florida during that time. And so when I think about 125 years ago, I imagine my family being kind of in this area. And I'm grateful for that sacrifice. And I know that the United Methodist Church is like a stream that a, that a lot of waters have flowed into. A few weeks ago, I celebrated with Mount Zion Church in Clearwater, their 100th anniversary, a, a Methodist church in the black tradition, the black church, uh, and how we've all flowed into this stream together. Uh, and, and I want to reflect on how we are Christians in this particular tradition in, in a very simple way. Because what really unites us uh, is not our politics. I imagine there's political differences, amen? We've been through this week in our nation. But what unites us is the saving grace of Jesus Christ, amen? This is what we share in common. It's, it's really the only purpose by which we gather together to worship God through Jesus Christ and we take that message out into the world. And so I want to walk us through what we understand to be the grace of Jesus Christ that saves us. And it begins with the idea that God's grace is present in our lives before we are even aware of it. Paul writes in Ephesians, we were dead, dead in our trespasses. And then there's that wonderful word in verse 4, but God, but God. 
If you have a Bible and you write in it, you might even circle those two words. But God, because that's a turning point and it's something God does. That word but there is significant. I heard someone give a lecture uh, some time ago on language and they said whenever you see the word or hear the word but, you can just ignore everything that came before it and pay attention to what's next. So if my wife says, Ken, you've been helping out a lot around the house lately, but <laughs> I know that I need to pay attention to what comes next. And that's true in this passage of Scripture. There's the old life, but God. And that is the prevenient grace of God, which means the grace of God that is present in our lives before we're aware of it, which means this church didn't start the day most of us walked onto this campus. Amen? Something was going on 125 years ago. It's why we baptize babies. Because we know that the grace of God is present in the life of that infant and that that's going to contribute to that child someday waking up to the grace of God that's just all around them. Prior to our awareness, God is at work in our lives to save us. God created every one of us in God's image. That's Genesis 1, 27. Every person here this morning, every person you will meet this week has been created in the image of God. Now one of the ways I sometimes think about this is to take a coin and if you took a coin and just pressed that coin into, your, into the palm of your hand and just left it there for a little bit of time and then removed it, what would you have in the palm of your hand? You'd have an image or an imprint of what? The coin. Every one of us has the imprint, the image of God stamped upon us in creation, which means every person has a fundamental human dignity. Because every one of us is a child of God, created in the image of God. Every person. And, and the, one of the reasons John Wesley, one of our ancestors in this church, was such an amazing evangelist was that he believed that that image could never be erased. It could never be lost. Some churches believe that by sin, that image goes away. It's tarnished. It's, it's, it's just gone forever. John Wesley refused to believe that. He believed that the most lost person could be found. Amen? And that leads to the next part of our understanding of salvation, and that is our sin. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned. Say that word all with me. All. All have sinned. Those of us up here on the upper part of the stage, we have sinned. All have sinned. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And throughout history, we've had a number of ways of reflecting on what sin means. Martin Luther said, it was the heart curved in on itself. That's the way he describes sin. The Greek language of the New Testament, the Greek word armartia, it's like missing the mark. Anyone here throw darts? It's like sometimes we want to throw a dart and we want to hit the center, but you know, we don't even hit the whole board. Literally, the Greek word for sin in the New Testament is when we miss the mark. And, and the Bible says we all have done it. We all have sinned. Sin is described in the New Testament also sometimes as a kind of a sickness. Sin is the tarnishing of that image. 
Sin is what happens to us when, when we get bruised and harmed. And that happens in life. You live long enough, we commit sins toward others. Others commit sins toward us. We harm each other. And we sin. In the Old Testament, sin is recognizing that we were created in the image of God and trying to fill that image, that imprint, with things that are not God. Amen? And so we try to fill our lives, that sort of God imprint in our lives, we try to fill it with things that are not God. And so we make other things God. We make money a God. Or power a God. Or politics a God. Or pleasing other people a God. Or being successful a God. Brothers and sisters, none of those things are God. The Old Testament calls this when we take something that's not God and try to fill the space in our lives in our heart that is God the Old Testament calls this making an idol and it's not like we're out there in the parking lot making stone idols of things Isaiah says woe is me for I'm undone I'm a man of unclean lips I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips we have all done this we have all made idols and that's making too much of something that we should not do amen something that takes the place in our lives of God and the way beyond this we understand is repentance to repent now in the New Testament to repent is not just to feel bad about something to feel sorry about something it's literally to turn in a new direction any men out there who never ask for directions when you're driving somewhere my wife says that's me uh, it's to know that I'm going down Fletcher in the wrong direction I should be going west when I've been going east. It's reorienting ourselves. It's turning. And one of the, one of the most remembered stories Jesus told, the prodigal son. It's the, it's the place in the story where the son is in the far country and has hit bottom. And... And, and Jesus says that he came to himself. Some of the most beautiful words in the Bible. He came to himself. And he thought, you know, this is not who I am. I can go home. I can go home. And so the prodigal begins the journey home. That's repentance. Repentance is coming home to our true self to the person God created us to be and when we begin that journey home we experience what we call the justifying grace of God two of the two of the verses in the New Testament that really were at the heart of, I would say, my conversion experience were Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace you've been saved through faith. And this is the gift of God. Not the result of my works, lest I should boast. The fact, if, if we believe in Jesus, if we would call ourselves Christians, brothers and sisters, it's, it's nothing we've done. It's nothing we should take credit for. It's a gift. It's just, it's just someone gave us a gift. The fact that we're sitting here, someone gave us a gift and said, here, open it. It's for you. 
That's the grace of God. It's just saying yes to that gift. But we didn't create the gift. We simply accepted it. That it was for us. And we say yes. Yes, I want to believe. Yes, I want to trust. Yes, I want to follow Jesus. Now, in some churches, thinking back to the different cakes we bake, in some churches, that would be the end of the sermon. You're probably thinking, how do I find that church? I can go home now. For us, that's not the end of the sermon. That's not the end of the gospel. That's not the end of salvation. John Wesley had this beautiful image that provenient grace is like the porch. That's the grace that's there before we're aware of it. And justifying grace, saying yes, is like the, is like the door. But the whole point is to live in the house. And that is sanctifying grace. And this is really important for us as United Methodist Christians. We are invited not just to hang out on the porch, not just to stay there and open the door, but to live in the house. And we're invited to live in the house together. Sanctifying grace is personal and it's social. It's personal holiness and it's social holiness. And they're like two wings of an airplane. You cannot have one without the other. And personal holiness is, is prayer and scripture and worship and praise. That's personal holiness. That's my personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's kneeling at an altar. That's personal holiness. But holiness and sanctification are about more than my personal relationship with God. Because God has put us in this world for a purpose. My wife and I have a small uh, home in the mountains of western North Carolina. We lived there most of our adult life before coming to Florida. And one summer afternoon, we were there for a few days, and it was, it was just starting to drizzle, and I went off to run an errand. I drove away from our little place, and uh, I rode by this little cabin, and there was this piece of furniture on the side of the road there for someone to pick up. And my wife has been a minister, but she's also been an interior uh, decorator. And she can do anything with furniture or anything like that. And I thought, I bet my wife would like that. And so I drove, turned around and drove back, walked in. I said, I said, Pam, there's this piece of furniture beside the road. Do you want to go look at it? And within seconds, we were driving there. And so we, we went there, she saw it, she said, yes, we want that. And so we put it in the back of our car, it had a name, she said it was a vanity. It was a mess. But she saw something in it, and for several days she worked with that piece of furniture. And she stripped it, and she repaired it, and she replaced some things, and she beautified some things, and it became a sink in one of the rooms in that house. She saw something and she salvaged it. And that's what God does with us. God sees something in us, that original creation. And God finds us. And God salvages us. And God repurposes us. And so that sink has a function. 
It helps us to cleanse ourselves every day. There's personal holiness, but there's also social holiness. And they go together. They they cannot be separated. And social holiness simply means I cannot be holy without you, and you cannot be holy without me. That's what it means. So there are many different ways to be a Christian, and and we honor all of them. My great-grandfather who lived in this community was a Congregationalist. And my grandfather, his son, I knew them both very well, was a Quaker. My mother, who passed a year ago this past week, was a Baptist. And when we were little kids growing up almost in middle school, my my parents' marriage ended. We lived in a town in the deep south in Georgia. And church was everything to us. It was just everything to us. And my parents' marriage ended. I love my parents. They were simply doing the best they could. But their marriage ended. This was this was um, forty something years ago. Time divorce was a real taboo. And a couple of people in my mom's church, in our church, had a conversation with her and said, "Um, it might be good if you found another church. They just quietly had that conversation with her. And so I remember as a little boy, we we had this kind of awkward season where we didn't go to church. And it just did not feel normal for our family. And then a few months later, my mother was a teacher. One of her teacher friends invited us to their Methodist church. It was around the time of the merger. Just happens to have been then but invited us to their Methodist church. It didn't have amazing music like this. The whole church could have fit in one of these sections. It was tucked back in a neighborhood. It was hard to find. I can't remember any of the sermons. But what I remember, what I, what I got was... This was a church with enough love in it to welcome a family going through a chaotic time and you might even say a crisis. And that was how I became a United Methodist. That has fundamentally to do, brothers and sisters, with holiness. Because that first church had an implicit understanding of holiness that my holiness depends on my being separated from your unholiness as they understood it. Do you understand that? That was what was going on there. It was that we have to be separated because you've had this experience in your family for our church to continue to be what it is. And that second church had a very different understanding of holiness. It was actually an understanding of holiness that comes straight from John Wesley. Holiness is not our being separate from each other. Holiness is loving God and loving our neighbor. And John Wesley got that straight from Jesus. What is the first and greatest commandment? To love God, and the second one is like it, to love my neighbor. That's how we work out our salvation. Once we know that we have been saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, and this is not our work, lest any of us should boast, once we know that, 
That's not the ending, that's the beginning. The rest of our lives, we get to put that into practice. And we get to give that to other people who maybe don't deserve it in the same way I didn't deserve it. Salvation is not something that is related to my righteousness. It's there in the Scripture. It is a gift. And so as we look to the next 125 years, there are people like my mother and her children within walking distance of every one of our churches. And God has planted us in a mission field in Florida. Not to turn in upon ourselves, but to open our eyes and to open our hands and to take this gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and to share it Amen? When I was growing up in that church, we had an altar. And we would go and kneel at that altar. And sometimes we would walk down the center of the church and stand at that altar. And that was the way we accepted God's gift of salvation. And that's that's crucial that we do. And if there's someone here this morning who has never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I hope you will speak to one of the pastors or to one of us, and, and this could be the day, it would be a, a, an amazing day to accept that gift. But I'm assuming that many of us can remember a time when we, when we did accept that gift. And a 125th anniversary is a wonderful day to say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my vision toward blessing other people. Seeing the imperfections in others not as a reason for us to be separate from each other, but as a way that something beautiful can be salvaged. Just as God saved me, repurposed me, uses me. Let us pray. Oh God, it, our lives were a mess, but God, you saw us, many of us, along the side of the road. You noticed us. You were faithful to us. You were faithful to our church. We praise you this day for all that is in the past. And we trust you and we give thanks for all that is in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.